later today, someone else stopped me here. They, they want to have sacramentals. They want to have uh, their medals and their uh, rosaries and, and things blessed. If you have those, there will be a blessing uh, with a prayer that Father Altier had given me. It's uh, from the old Roman ritual. Uh, it's uh, the whole exercise salt, he'll exercise water. Uh, there'll be the prayer of, I'll ask Father to do it. Um, and for any sacramental, if you have a St. Benedict medal or whatever, they're out there as well. Get those, arm yourself with them, put them around your children if they're struggling. If you got kids going off to college, I'll share one quick story and then I'll let everybody take a break here. Uh, there was a friend of mine when he went to college. His mother gave him his rosary, gave him uh, a St. Benedict medal and a miraculous medal, told him to wear these, right? So he went into this party, it was right around this time of year, it was Halloween, and a bunch of people were playing with a Ouija board. They were all in there and they were talking to some spirit. You know, it was supposedly some kid who just died in a car accident was speaking to them and the Ouija board's going back and forth. So he got kind of spooked and he, he's a Catholic, he says, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna be in here. So he went back down to his car, he took the rosary his mom gave him and then he put on his sacramentals, right? He went back up into that room and all of a sudden, the second he walked in, everything stopped. The Ouija board stopped, the little pendant there stopped moving. And the kids are in there saying, why, David, why aren't you talking to us? Tell us more about your accident, tell us more. The Ouija board wouldn't talk to him. And they kept pleading for it, pleading for it to communicate to him. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the thing started going and it spelled out again these words. It said, I smell God. That's what it said, I smell God. Well, it was a sign for him personally of the power of sacramentals, and he never took his off again, and he wears them. So, you know, a, spiritual warfare is a reality. I don't see Satan under every rock and around every corner. I think we need to be balanced in life, but I'll tell you what, we do ourselves a disservice and our family an injustice if we are not aware of the way Satan infiltrates through pornography, uh, through the occult, through a whole litany of other things that are infiltrating our society today. Arm yourselves. Use blessed water, use blessed salt, pick up your rosary and pray that. Those are the things that we need to do. And that's why we have a conference like this today, because I think this is real stuff. Uh, I, I spoke to a man on the air just a week ago. He's in a big uh, ministry right now dealing with people who have addictions, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, sex addiction. His was rooted in the demonic. He opened himself up to it and he actually had to go through an exorcism. And, and I do think addiction, some addiction is rooted in that. I mean, some is psychological, there's other factors, but I do think that we, we go blindly today through, through, through life without the reality. What did Christ do? He cast so many demons out all, quite often before he healed. So we need to protect ourselves. We also need to be aware of these realities. And there'll be more coming. Father Altier will address us. Moira will go through more on the new age and crystals and all the rest of the, uh, the occult type of stuff. I, I'll share just a couple, couple minutes or a couple thoughts with you as well. You know, when we deal with this stuff on the occult, I always get, I, I don't know, I, yeah, I, I believe in the spiritual reality, but I had an exorcist one time say to me, he said that one sacramental confession is worth more than 10,000 exorcisms. And that's something, you know, Hollywood makes exorcisms look pretty scary. Head spinning, doors flying, shut, people levitating. One sacramental confession more powerful than 10,000 exorcisms. And that's something really important. The other thing, don't give, don't give power to Satan. Don't, don't empower him with your fear. I was with an exorcist in Chicago and I was asking about this stuff because honestly, not a whole lot scares me except for this stuff. You know, I'm a baby when it comes, I won't watch, you know, these exorcism movies or things like that. I mean, I could see Freddy Krueger and everybody else, the Chainsaw Massacre, so they don't bother me. This stuff's a reality and it's scary. And he says to me, he says, Drew, you know something? Yeah, objects do move. People do levitate. They do reveal things in these exorcisms. He says, but he has no power. Do not give him the power. So don't, don't fear these types of things. When you do that, you give Satan an undue power. There's a simple prayer a priest taught me. It's, I think it's 10 words or eight words. Uh, and actually he says, all you have to do is pray this prayer. I claim the protection of the blood of the lamb. I, cl I claim the protection of the blood of the lamb. 10 words. I claim the protection of the blood of the lamb. This is very, very powerful. So if you feel there's agitation, division, problems in the home, begin to pray that prayer. 10 words. I claim the protection of the blood of the lamb. That's all you have to pray. And the other thing is, arm yourself with sacramentals. I believe in them. My rosary's blessed, my St. Benedict cross. Those are important things. Use blessed water and salt in your home. My neighbor had a daughter who was waking up in the middle of the night screaming. She was seeing a man in a room called the scary man. Uh, she'd say, daddy, daddy, please come in. The scary man's here, the scary man. 
So they said to me, they weren't Catholic, and they said, what's this, you know, well, I don't know what to do. She's having these like night terrors. So I gave them some blessed salt. I said, just sprinkle it underneath of her bed, you know, sprinkle it around your room. Those night terrors, those visions, whatever she was having, gone. They'd moved into this home. I don't know what happened in that home prior to them moving in there. Have your home blessed. Your home hasn't been blessed. Get your home blessed. That's a no-brainer. Very, very powerful stuff. So make sure, and, and use the sacrament of confession. If you have not been there in a while, one sacramental confession worth more than 10,000 exorcisms. Gentlemen, if you're struggling with pornography, and one out of two men does, one out of two Christian men, uh, so you look around the room, uh, you know, have, a, have an issue with this. You know, if, if you're dealing with same-sex attraction, if you're dealing with other things that are leading you perhaps in a way uh, of life that you shouldn't be going in, use the sacraments. Uh, that's, that's the power that we have within the church, and it's far more powerful. Father Gabriel Amorth, who is the lead exorcist, the head exorcist in Rome, he was even talking about the power of one Hail Mary in what it does. Somebody asked him during an exorcism, uh, he asked one of the demons, he said to the demon, he says, how many of you are there? He's talking to this possessed person. And the demon hissed back at him. He says, if you could see us, we would blot out the sun. That's how many. But you know, there's nothing to fear. Christ is more powerful, right? Christ is more powerful. And that's why we have these days, I think, to help raise awareness, uh, to go ahead and to, uh, in a special way, arm ourselves spiritually and to, to, to go away with this type of stuff. Uh, I think we live in a special time, too. Just, just one other note here. Um, you know, we can look at stuff personally, you know, internally. We have division in our home. You're worried about your kids who are away from the faith. You're worried about drugs. You're worried about the, all these issues that, that you may be grappling with right now. You know, the loved one involved in New Age or whatever. Um, but on a, that's a more of a micro scale. It's more of a personal scale. On a macro or a much larger type of scale, um, we saw this. I mean, Satan has left his fingerprints he has been in the shadows for centuries. I think he's becoming more aggressive than ever today, personally. That's my, my perspective on it. I mean, never have we seen what happened in the 20th century. And back in 1884, there was a pope, Pope Leo XIII, who had a vision. Many of you may already know of his vision. He was coming out of the Sistine Chapel one afternoon. And as he was coming out of this chapel, uh, he stood frozen. And he was staring at the tabernacle for what they say was about 10 minutes, his eyes transfixed on, on the tabernacle. And as whatever he was encountering or seeing ended, he collapsed on the floor. Well, clergy, everybody came to him. They roused him up. He went back to his papal chambers afterwards, and he penned the St. Michael prayer. That used to be said after every low mass. And then he would go on and write encyclicals on the power of the rosary. But when asked what he saw, he said he didn't so much see as he heard. And he said he heard a conversation between God and a very dark, nefarious voice, Satan. One voice was very deep and beautiful and calming, full of love, and the other was just empty and cold and evil. And he heard this conversation in which this evil voice was saying to God, people only love you. He says, they only love you when things are going well with them. Give me more time and more power, and I'll show you they don't love you. And God said to him, how much time do you need? He says, the next 70 to 100 years. And there was a pause. And then God answered back, according to Pope Leo XIII. He said, uh, that time is granted. Now, there's some controversy over what happened here. He went on. He wrote the St. Michael prayer. He went on, wrote the encyclical. Did the 100 years began? Uh, in 1884? Did it begin on the anniversary of his death, when his papacy was over in 1904? Or did it begin with those famed visions in Fatima, 1917? Those visions, by the way, were 33 years to the date of that apparition, you know, which is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, some believe that this century is Satan's century, and I, I, don't, I, I don't think we can dispute it. I mean, never... Every, ev every epic has had its evil. You know, Genghis Khan, you, you go throughout the, you the decades, you look at the evils of the Middle Ages, you take a look at the problems that have besieged the world. But I'll tell you what, there has never been evil like there has been in the 20th century where cold, calculated, organized chambers were built to execute people. Six million plus people died in the concentration camps of Adolf Hitler. 20 million people starved and were put to death in the gulags uh, of, uh, of, of the Soviet Union there. You take a look at Lenin and Marx, you take a look at Mao, they estimate anywhere from 60 to 100,000 people probably died under his rule. 
then what do we have? We've got a contraceptive mentality that takes God out of that unit of act. We see man tinkering with the very fabric of human life. We see the legalization of murder in our own day where 50 million plus children have been killed in their mother's womb, one of the safest places in the world, now one of the most evil. And it doesn't end there. As that becomes commonplace and we've grown numb and desensitized to that, what's next? Suddenly we're killing our elderly. A girl in St. Petersburg, Florida, died because nobody could give her a glass of water by judicial edict. She was starved and dehydrated to death, and this is happening around the world. And we're seeing more and more of this. Marriage in our country is under attack. John Paul II says, as marriage goes, so does the nation, so does the rest of the world. And we're seeing it redefined. We're seeing an aberrant behavior become mainstream. We're seeing what was once clearly black become white, what was wrong become right. We see a great desensitization to uh, things that are sinful, and we see a great glorification of those things right now. Uh, these are special times, and I think that's also why we see in a special way the Mother of God appearing in every habitable continent. From 1846, when she appeared in La Salette and warned of a coming chastisement if the world did not return to God, she had to hold back their hand. What do we see? We saw that happen, 1846. Great blight falls over Western Europe. The big, great potato famine takes place. A million people die in France from the wheat shortage. Soon afterwards, what happens across the Atlantic in, Ch in Champion, Wisconsin, the mother of God appears in our own country, warning of a great chastisement that would follow. Twelve years to the date of that prophecy, we see exactly that happen. You know, what was the message to Sister Adele in those visions? To teach the world, to teach the faith to, to this wild frontier. She had no education. She didn't know how to do that. St. Faustina had a second grade education. She didn't know how to be the apostle of God's mercy or the secretary of it, but God had chosen that. 1917, Our Lady comes in Fatima, warns of the rise of a, of a, of a great evil, of atheistic communism that would infect the world with its venom. The Holy Father would have much to suffer. But she gave us hope, and in the end, that's what happens. In the end, the Immaculate Heart will triumph. Throughout the centuries, throughout the decades, one of the most, I think, one of the most concerning harbingers of what is to come. Uh, it took place in Kibeho, Rwanda, a little tiny landlocked country in the heart of Africa where a lady came in 1981 and in 1989 gave these seers visions of rivers flowing with bodies and aisles filled with blood and people with no heads. And true to her prophecy, in 1994, a civil war erupts in Rwanda. And what do we see? We see neighbor turn on neighbor, doctor turn on nurse, teacher on student, killing one another with machetes. Bodies were left to bloat in the hot tropical sun there. Uh, the Kagera River, which means river of blood, had so many bodies floating in it, they were worried about it being polluted. And Our Lady warned about all of this, what was to come. See, and, th th this is, and she spoke of impurity there in a special way. And she spoke of strange new viruses and disease that would rise. But we have the secret, we have the formula. It's prayer and it's fasting, it's amending our lives, and it's returning to God. I mean, that's, that's the heart of all, it's the gospel message, fundamentally. It's just, it's not repackaged. It's just that God in his love and mercy today, as this evil rises like never before, and you can look at the early part of the century, you can look at our own time, the evils are equally as ugly. Different, but equally as ugly. I mean, you're not putting people in ovens today, but we are murdering people in massive numbers. I mean, we are destroying. Uh, we have programs on the air on Sundays dedicated to atheism. That's where we are today in this culture. What do we need to do? Our Lady said through prayer and fasting, you could stop wars. You could suspend the laws of nature through prayer and through fasting. And I don't know how many of you do that. How many of you spend time in prayer? I'm spending more time in prayer than I have ever spent in my life this past year in prayer. And I'm seeing the power of it. Your spiritual landscape will clear. It will clarify when you begin to pray. And when you fast, if you can do that, there is an amplification, there is a power that comes in that prayer. It's unbelievable. You got a problem in your family, you need a real answer to prayer, then you need to combine those two things. You need to pray and sacrifice. That's what Our Lady said in Fatima. She talked about sacrifice. She told the world to do penance, and yet we don't do that. She said the same thing in La Salette. It's prayer and penance and sacrifice. It's fasting. It's a return to God more than anything else. It's making sure that we get on that path back to God. You know, omission, the sin of omission, is just as great as any sin of commission. You know, a lot of times we don't stand up for truth in our culture. And that's part of the problem. And we see that today in a special way uh, in, in, in our culture when it comes to life. In fact, you know, I, I think God is working in a very special way here in this, uh, 
for this conference. As I said, I underwent a lot of spiritual warfare. Uh, I know that those who were involved in this encountered the same type of thing, and I think God has a message for us today.